Well, as we've been with David on Sunday mornings, David failed severely, didn't he? Oh, he did indeed. He failed severely, and he's suffering the consequences. And as we come to this place today, as we left off last Sunday morning, David is forced out of Jerusalem by his son Absalom. Absalom is usurping the throne of king. He's saying, I'm king. David, dad, you are out of here. He is pursuing his father to kill him and pursuing his father's throne. So David and his group, his small group of people, men and women, are leaving Jerusalem, and that's when we left off last week. But indeed, in this, David had failed, but he's learned a valuable lesson. Even after you failed, you can still follow God. Isn't that good news? Anybody in here in that category, you don't have to raise your hand if you're in failure right now. But we all fail at one time or another, don't we? And I think of... uh, Pastor Chuck, and I think of the ministry of Calvary Chapel, 45 years ago or so, how the whole movement started, the Jesus People movement, and Pastor Chuck opening up the doors to a bunch of hippies who are unwanted by society. Some of you are part of that group. You've cut your hair since then, and praise God, you've taken showers since then and things, and, <laughs> and, uh, but God is good, and you were saved at that time, and then I got saved some years later, but, but uh, part of that, and in that process... A lot of us certainly have friends that were close that were walking and going to church and then they've disappeared from the scene and they've, they've gotten angry at God, angry at people or whatever and uh, they've failed and maybe you're in that place tonight, today, you need to understand that God loves you and he wants you back and this last week has been a wake up call for a lot of people who started in the Calvary Chapel uh, movement. But I'm reminded of this, reminds me of some words of Pastor Chuck Following God is a pursuit, it's not an arrival. A lot of times we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and people think, aha, I've arrived, no more trouble for me. That usually, what I found, is the time when trouble begins. But what happens is we, get, we, we, we start following Christ and we're thinking, man, life is good, and then the trials come, or this person says that, and we get our feelings hurt, and we stop going to church, and... And I, and I look at the ministry of Chuck, faithful, following God is a pursuit. It's not an arrival. We don't arrive there. We, we, yes, we arrive at the place of salvation, but it's following him for the rest of our lives. And Pastor Chuck set that good example, but I want you to know that maybe you're again in that place. And, and you're thinking, um, I've got, I'm in the place of failure. I can't get over this bump. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you. And today we're going to go to that place. So let's get going. As we look at, first of all, with King David, we see a sorrowful king. David's been kicked out of Jerusalem. He's got a small band of people with him. And and we're picking up right in the middle. He's still leaving Jerusalem. Some people are still following him. His son Absalom is now the self-appointed king in Jerusalem. But with David, verse 24, 2 Samuel chapter 15 says, And there was Zadok also. And all the Levites that were with him, Zadok was a priest, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they sat down, and they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up until all the people had finished crossing over from the city. Let me stop there at verse 24. This is what's going on. Again, David and all his people, they're moving out of Jerusalem. They're forced out by Absalom. Absalom wants to kill David and, and take over the throne, and he's doing just that. So the people are moving across. They've come down the mountain in Jerusalem, the city of David. They've crossed the Kidron Valley. They start going up to the top of the Mount of Olives. What happens as they go down? Well, it tells us here there's Zadok and Abiathar, and they've got the Ark of the Covenant. Zadok and Abiathar are priests, and we're going to find out in just a second. Their sons are with them also. If you recall, when the Ark of the Covenant was transported, it was to be put on poles, And then the ark would be there, so you have a priest here, a priest here, behind a priest, and behind a priest. And they would take the ark of the covenant, and then they would walk forward. That's what's going on here. You have these four priests with Abiathar and Zadok. They're crossing before the people. They cross the Kidron. And then they set the ark of the covenant down. They're following David. They got the ark. The verse 25 says, then the king, that would be David, he says to Zadok, the priest, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, 
God will bring me back and show me both the city and his dwelling place. But if God says thus, I have no delight in you, here I am, let God do to me as seems good to him. So what's David saying there in verses 25 and 26? Whatever the Lord wills for my life, it's okay with me. I'm kicked out of Jerusalem. My own son wants to kill me. If God wants to bring me back to Jerusalem and set me on in the palace and on the throne again, then so be it. But if God doesn't, then let him, verse 26, do as seems good to him. Either way, I am content. Either way, praise be the Lord. If God brings me back, God set me on the throne before, he can set me on the throne again. But if he doesn't want to do that, I'm okay with it. I understand I messed up. I'm going through consequences. God is the sovereign one. I am going to trust in him. We continue, verse 27. And then the king also said to Zadok the priest, are you not a seer? What's a seer? A seer is a prophet. So Zadok was both a priest and a prophet. And he says, return to the city in peace and your two sons with you, Ahimaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. Verse 28, see, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zadok and Abiathar, they carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. So David, he went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives, and he wept up, and he wept as he went up, and he had his head covered and went barefoot, and all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went. What a picture we have here. The ark of God, the people, the small band of people traveling across the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, heading out to the wilderness, weeping as they're going, face covered, head covered, barefoot. It is a funeral procession. That's the type of procession it is. The kingdom is gone and his heart is broken. And the people with David are devastated. But they are following their suffering king. Let me pause and, and, and make a mention of this before we move on. I'm often asked, and really have been since we started with the life of David, why is it that in the Bible, God says that David was a man after my own heart when David committed some horrible, horrible sins? He did commit some horrible sins, didn't he? Why is it that he is considered a man after God? Because here's the deal. When David was confronted on his sin, David repented. Lesser men and lesser women would make excuses. We label sins, don't we? This sin's worse than that sin. This sin is really, really bad. This sin's kind of bad. This sin's not so bad. You know why you say this sin's not so bad? Because that's the ones you commit, right? But the other guy commits the really, really bad ones. God says, man, it's all sin. He looks at it all as being sin. And David was willing to repent when he's busted in his sin Lesser men, lesser women make excuses. And also David at this moment of his trial. He doesn't complain. He doesn't lash out at God. He doesn't blame God. He doesn't blame other people. When he went through his trials in the days of Saul, he didn't blame Saul. And he doesn't here blame Absalom. He trusts in God. When he's busted in sin, he turns to God and repents. When he goes through his trial, he trusts in God. Lesser men, lesser women start the blame game and start the excuse game. Why was David a man after God's own heart? David was a man just like you and me. He sinned. We label which sins are worse. God sees it all as sin. What makes a person a, a man or woman of God is whether or not they repent and whether or not they trust in God. In verses 25 and 26, indeed, we see is trust in God. If God chooses to have me leave Jerusalem forever, then I'm good with it. But if God chooses to have me back, then I am good with it. Let him, verse 26, do to me as seems good to him. This is a reminder for me of the words from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
This is where David is. It's okay. I've learned some lessons. I'm taking the licks, whether I am abased and I have to leave Jerusalem forever, or whether God brings me back and I abound, it's okay. Can you say that? See, we can say it easily when things are going good, right? But when the bottom falls out, man, it's tough to say it, isn't it? But this is the path that God leaves us or, or leads us along. But as we see David here, the scene is sad. Verse 30, it's like a funeral march. His head is covered. The people are weeping. He's weeping. He, he's barefoot. David was the king in the palace just a few hours before, and now they packed up their bags and they are all leaving town. Indeed, David is a king of sorrows. How much we relate to the Lord Jesus Christ in this, which we'll see in just a second. But in this place, as the people are following their king of sorrows, their sorrowful king, we see that there's some of them that are indeed making a willful or a willing sacrifice, a willing sacrifice. Note that both Zadok and Abiathar are priests. As priests, they have a calling. Their calling is to be with the ark of God. What did David say to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, to do? To take the ark of God and do what? Go back to Jerusalem, right? And not only that, according to verse 27, take your sons with you. Wow, that's quite a big deal. Because Absalom knew that Abiathar and Zadok had, had gone with David. Now they are coming back. They knew, excuse me, or three quarters breakfast, but that's another point. <laughs> Just stating the obvious. But Abiathar and Zadok, they've got to go back to Jerusalem. They've got a calling. They're calling as priests, and they've got to take their sons with them, and the Ark of the Covenant is going to, and they know that they could be killed by Absalom. You went with David. They were indeed entering into a place of a willful sacrifice. As one person said, it was the moment of a spiritual crisis, the moment when they had to make a decision, and it wouldn't affect just them, but also their kids, their two sons are going with them. Listen, God calls us to that place, doesn't he? We all have a calling, whatever it may be. I am called to be a pastor. I am called to preach the gospel and to teach the word of God. But I'm also called to be a dad. I'm also called to be a husband. We all have our calling, whatever it may be. And sometimes that calling is, is a place where we go to the moment of a spiritual crisis and we don't want to go down that path. We're thinking, Lord, I don't want to go there. Nevertheless, what do we see Zadok and Abiathar do? They are obedient to the king. When we have to make that, 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 that decision, that moment of spiritual crisis, are we able to be obedient to the king? Think of it like this. Jesus is not asking, do you love my calling for you? He's asking, do you love me? Do you love me? I'm not asking, do you like what you're going through? Nobody likes this kind of stuff to go through. You're crazy. If you raise your hand right now and you say, I love going through trials. I love it when everything goes wrong in my life. I love it when I, got, when I get a phone call. I can't wait till the doctor calls me and tells me I got cancer, right? That's insane. Are you that insane? No. We don't love that kind of stuff. Jesus isn't saying, I'm, I, 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 do you love what's happening to you? Do you love your calling? He's saying, do you love me? And these people with David are able to say, you know, you're the sorrowful king. You're the surrendered king. You're the, you're the one who's submitted to the Lord. The same thing with you and I. Are we surrendered to the Lord? It's not do you love what's happening. It's do you love me? So we see a willful sacrifice. We also see a certain satisfaction, a certain satisfaction. Abiathar and Zadok, they've got the Ark of the Covenant. They go back to Jerusalem with their two sons, and they're, they're going to worship God in Jerusalem. And David, so they're surrendered to the king, King David, and also the king of kings, because they're being obedient. And also David is surrendered to the king of kings, the Lord on high, understanding that this is what I'm willing to do. I'm willing to send them back. Oh, I'd love to have them with me. They're the spiritual ones. I need that. But wait a minute, they need to be in Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant, oh, how I'd love to have that Ark with me. I've got to send the Ark back. 
Why was he willing to do that? Because David understood that there was nothing magical in the ark. If he was going to have his help, his help was going to come from God. David trusted in God, not the ark. The ark would not be his protection nor his lucky charm. He trusted in God and put his faith in the hands of God. The Israelites before David, they thought the ark was a lucky charm. They took the ark into battle, and they lost the battle and lost the ark. The Philistines captured the ark. They thought it was a lucky charm, and they took it to their camp, and they found out that they were defeated because they had the ark of the covenant. If you ever saw the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, that's what this is about, the people thinking the Ark of God was, the Ark of the Covenant was a lucky charm. David understood it wasn't about that. What happened to David when he was obedient to the Lord, sent the priest back and, and the Ark back, as one person said, the reality of the indwelling power of God brought heaven near to David and made God real to his soul. And David was able to say, if God, God brings me back to Jerusalem, I'm good with it. If God determines that I can't, I'm good with it. Either way, David was surrendered, he was submissive, and he's able to rest and be satisfied in the will of God for his life. But, before we move on, I'm reminded of this statement. Often the paths that the Lord designs for us are designed to provide a witness for others. When David entered into this place, he's got to leave Jerusalem, his own son wants to kill him. He became a witness for everyone that was with him. A witness that he was trusting in the Lord. A witness that the Lord was his salvation. A witness that he was forgiven. A witness that regardless, God was sovereign and whatever happens to me, I'm okay with it because God loves me even if other people don't love me. You and I go through trials. It's the same thing. We are being molded and shaped, conformed into the image of Christ in those times of trials, right? But at the same time, do you know you're being watched? How we handle those things. Does our life point to Christ? Does it point to trusting in the Lord? Or do we start to complain and blame other people for what we're going through and get mad at God and other people are witnessing and thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want anything to do with this God you're telling me about. We're being watched. The fact that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, man, you and I are being watched. But all of this passage, the whole passage that we're reading today, all of it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. David becomes a type of Christ as in a suffering servant that the lowly people are following. You and I, our lives in the times of trials, we also ought to be pointing to Christ, all of it reminds us of Christ, who Isaiah wrote about so many centuries before Jesus was born. In Isaiah 53, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. David, the sorrowful king, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the spiritual sovereign sorrowful king, a man of sorrows who has borne our griefs and borne our sorrows so that we would be forgiven of our sins for the trusting in him. Also note this. As David crossed the Kidron, and the people crossed the Kidron with him, right? They were up in Jerusalem at the city of David. They went down the mountainside. They crossed the brook Kidron. Tells us right here. They crossed the brook Kidron. Verse 30. Then they ascended up to the Mount of Olives, weeping as they went, right? The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, he's in the city of David having the Last Supper. He descends down across the Kidron Valley, goes up to the Mount of Olives. There on the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is betrayed with a kiss. He's arrest, arrested and he's brought back down the mountainside across the Kidron Valley, up to be crucified and beaten and tried for our sins. Here's the other significant thing. Josephus estimates... That on Passover, at the time when Jesus was crucified, 
that there probably were 250,000 lambs that were sacrificed. The blood from the lamb sacrifices would have flowed down from the Temple Mount, down into the Kidron Valley. When Jesus was taken across the Kidron, his robe would have been dipped and covered with that blood of the lamb, and the people would have missed it. The very lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is the one who's about to be arrested and crucified. And they're looking at the 250,000 lambs thinking it's going to do them some good. But let me show you how it worked. Here is Jerusalem. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, you have the gold dome. And then this is the Temple Mount. This picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. Garden of Gethsemane is right over here. This is the valley down below, the Kidron Valley. And uh, you can't see the topography from that picture. This picture, you can see it much better, can't you? So this is the city of David. You can see how it dips down. This is the Kidron right here. The blood from the lambs would flow down here. Jesus would be carried down through here across that. Here's another picture. That outlines the city of David. Here's an artist's rendition of the, what the city of David uh, would have looked like in the days of David. So he, he leaves his palace with the few with him. He goes down into the Kidron Valley. Then he went up the other side on the way to the wilderness. And this is what it looks like when you go there today. In the words of Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon wrote, we do not like to cross the Kidron, do we? The Kidron represents sorrow, represents trial, represents difficulty. David and the people with him, the small band of people with him, crossing the Kidron. The Lord Jesus Christ crossing the Kidron. We don't like to go across the Kidron. Nevertheless, in that, we become a great witness pointing other people to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who crossed the Kidron on his way to the cross to be sacrifices for the sins of the world. We see David here as the sorrowful king. We also see him as the surrendered king. Verse 31 tells us, then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, oh, Lord. I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Who is Ahithophel? Well, remember Ahithophel from last Sunday morning? Ahithophel was David's best friend and counselor, and he defected from David's kingdom. He went over to Absalom. Ahithophel was also Bathsheba's grandfather. But something about Ahithophel, Ahithophel was a genius. And he had great counsel, and David knew that the counsel that Ahithophel would give to Absalom would cause Absalom to be able to catch David and kill him. So he prays to God. God, turn his counsel into foolishness, and God would indeed hear his prayers. Verse 32, and it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God, there was Hushai, the archite, coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. Who is Hushai? Hushai, he was a friend of David. He's got dust on his head, his robe torn, he's, he's mourning. In verse 33, David says to Hushai, if you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now also be your servant, then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. What's going on in verse 34? David is saying, Hushai, I want you to be a mole for me. I want you to go be a spy for me in Absalom's kingdom. Verse 35, and do you not have Zadok and Abiathar, the priests there, with you? Therefore, it will be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Indeed, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. As we look at this place with David, the place where he is, he's running for his life, he's got a small band of people with him, I can't help but think if I were to sum up this passage that we've read today, it would be this. Are you willing to be made nothing for the sake of the Lord of glory? Um, a lot of times we say, yeah, Lord, I'll be, humble me. Lord, take away everything I have. We can say that, right? 
And then when it starts to go, well, don't take that. Don't touch that over there. Well, wait a minute, Lord. I'm still, hold on. Wait, wait, stop. When did I agree to this whole thing? David had been humbled, but David had also been redeemed. It's easy to say, Lord, humble me. It's easy to say it, but it's hard and painful to go there. But God does it with us. But in this process, note real simple what David did. David prayed, right? Verse 31, he hears, Ahithophel's got counsel, he prays. Note this. In David's prayer, he was specific. Ahithophel's counsel, Lord, make his counsel foolishness. Here's how Christians often pray. This is it. Real general. Lord, bless all the children of the world. In Jesus' name, bless the food. Amen. Right? What kind of prayer is that? Lord, save everybody. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat. Right? David's specific, don't pray like that. I know you guys pray like that. I hear you at restaurants. It's not good. Be specific. David prayed, and he also worshiped. In verse 32, he takes time. He's being chased. He takes time to worship God. When we're being chased, when we're going through a trial, when life's difficult, prayer and worship is not usually at the top of our list. You know what's usually at the top of our list? I'm going to, let me get on the phone and start telling all my friends and tell them about all the problems I have. Listen, take it to the Lord. Take it to the Lord. Take it straight to the Lord. He's the one that's going to help you. Man, we get on Facebook. Here's all my problems. Send money. <laughs> whatever Or whatever, right? That's not how to handle it. The way to handle anything that comes your way. It's not going out and talking about it. It's not telling all your friends. It's not seeking this. It is praying and worshiping God. God, let me see what you are going to do. Let me watch you do it. When we go through the difficulty, we're exposed for who we really are. Someone said, spiritual health is reflected more in how we handle our mistakes than in the mistakes themselves. A man or a woman with a heart after God will always keep coming back to follow God. I would like to go somewhere for the next few minutes, all right? Will you go there with me? If you are, you got to turn to Psalm chapter 3. Psalm 3. And Psalm 3, while you're turning there, is a psalm of, Dave, uh, of David while he's running from Absalom. In fact, many scholars believe when David wrote Psalm 3, he wrote it the morning after the events we just read about in 2 Samuel chapter 15. David was running for Absalom. He prays, he worships God, he falls asleep. Many scholars believe it's there. He wakes up in the morning and he writes Psalm 3. He writes Psalm 3. Psalm 3 begins and says at the very top, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Verse 1, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Let me close with a few things for you, all right? Number one is this. As we look at this psalm and think of all that's going on with David, recognize that God will help you if you call upon him. This is what David hears. Absalom and all of his men are coming against me, and they're saying there's no help for me and God. But David knows that is a lie. David knew it was a lie. No salvation in God, that is a lie. No one to wash away his sin, it's a lie. No one to clothe him with righteousness, a lie. No one to present him faultless before the throne, a lie. No blood, no altar, no sacrifice, no great high priest, no Christ, no Calvary, no cleansing, no conversion. No help in God. David knew it was a lie. Listen, you go through moments where the enemy of your soul lies to you if you are in Christ. And you're thinking, I'm in trouble. There's no help for me in God. David knew it was a lie. In fact, at the end of verse 2, David writes, see lie. You know what that means? Think about that with an exclamation mark. No help for me in God? Ha! There is so help for me in God. I serve the King of kings, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. There's help for you in God. When Voltaire died, Voltaire the atheist, 
when he died in the 1600s. He's there on his deathbed crying out, looking at his life, realizing he was an atheist. And he says, there, I have been abandoned by man. I have been abandoned by God. There was no help for Voltaire in God. But for David, there was help. David was no Voltaire. David was a man of God. He was a man who knew God. David was a failing, a stumbling saint, but he knew God and knew his help was from the Lord. It's the same thing with you. There's help for you from God, and there's hope for you from God. Also note here in this psalm, reflect on the Lord and his triumph. That's what David did. Verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. Think about that, David says. I, I love that. Think about that. It's like a touche. Verse 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. David saying, man... Absalom has the numbers, but I have God. Absalom's got the 10,000s times 10,000s, but I have God. You're, you're, you may look at your life and say, man, I don't have help. I don't have hope. I've got this trial. I've got this defeat. I have this temptation. Listen, the enemy has the numbers, but you have Christ. You have God. I, I, I look at this. And I can't help but think, as I've been reflecting on this past week in the ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, when I first heard that I had help in God, before I went to Calvary chapels, I remember being raised Catholic, and I had Baptist friends and Methodist friends and Presbyterian friends, and they would all dress real nice and go to church and all that, and I'd look at them, and they would invite me to their church, and, and I knew, you know, as far as I could see, they were all stuffy. And... Um, and I remember, some of you are looking, you're wearing a stuffy tie this morning. Well, get over it. But that's another story. <laughs> but uh, I, I remember being invited to those churches. And I remember thinking, you know, I know what your church is like, Lutheran church or whatever, which is about that much different from a Catholic church. I think the guy up front can get married. That's about the only difference. And, but um, I remember thinking, well, why would I switch the Catholic church just go from one stuffy place to another. I mean, that's the way I looked at it. And then you know, I, I was down. I had no help from God at that point in my life. And then, and then I was living down at the beach and went to Calvary, Costa Mesa, and I realized, I, hey, I understand what that guy says. And he was kind of a jolly old guy. And, <laughs> and he preached the truth of sin and the hope of Christ. And I got it. And a lot of you got it, right? There is no help apart from God, but in God there is help for anyone who will call upon him. David realizes, in the Lord is my triumph. Absalom has the numbers. Satan has the numbers. Satan had my number, but God has me. Here's the deal. We have Christ, if you're in Christ, but more importantly than we having Christ, if you are in Christ, Christ has you. There's hope, there's help in God. Amen? Amen. And last, last is this. Remember it is in the Lord that we put our trust. Look at verse 7 and 8. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Look at verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. Touche. Think about that. Salvation belongs to the Lord. I love that. Psalm 32 is another psalm that David wrote. There David wrote, For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him, but you are my hiding place. Remember that song? You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. All of this points back to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
All of it does. David's life, the Psalms, the work that the Lord has done. Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, I quoted verse 3 earlier, I started at verse 4. Isaiah continues, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. As Isaiah was writing about the Messiah to come, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. He was the one who was afflicted, beaten, bloodied, and bruised, that we might be forever forgiven and have the hope of eternal life, that we might be set free and find that he is our hiding places, and he is the one who delivers us from all of our enemies. Man, there's hope for us in God. As we get ready to go into communion, let this sink in. We never sink so low that we can no longer repent. You know what repent means? Repent means to make a decision to turn from your sin and turn to Christ. L- let, me exp- l- let me share this with you before we go to communion. Earlier I was talking about David, and David, he had committed some really grievous sins, but God forgave him because he repented. And how we label our sins, right? This sin is really, really bad. This sin is not as bad as that bad sin, and this sin isn't so bad probably because those are... Th- as the areas we go, right? God looks at all the same and God forgives. Here's, here's the hurdle that we have. It's in our finite minds. If somebody owes me 50 bucks, it's pretty easy for me to forgive them. I mean, 50, I'm not going to lose sleep over 50 bucks. But sometimes there's things that are done against a person that are really, really, really hard to forgive. About 15 years ago or so, I was teaching a message on forgiveness from the Gospel of Matthew. And afterwards, this lady came up to me, and she's crying. I mean, she's weeping. And she says, Pastor Tom, um, I know I'm supposed to forgive. And she goes, here, here, she gave me the story. And she said, there's this young man, he's going down the road about 50 miles an hour. He made the turn going 50 miles an hour, and he lost control of his vehicle, and he killed my son. And she said, um, uh, he went before the judge for reckless driving. I don't know if he was drunk driving or not, but reckless driving and manslaughter and some other things. She goes, I really felt that I was supposed to forgive him. So I reached down inside. I went to court, and I forgave him. I gave him all, everything I could to forgive him. And then the judge let him off the hook. And then she said, um, I was at the grocery store, and this happened just a few days before the grocery store. She goes, I'm at the grocery store. I'm pushing my cart. I turned down an aisle. And right when I turned, the young man who killed my son is coming the other way. She goes, our eyes met. I said, I forgive you. And he laughed at me. How do I forgive him? Here's the thing. In our humanness, I I explained to her as best I could, in our humanness, we're not God. And it can take a lifetime to work through that process, right? With God, it's immediate. You understand? With God, there's help for us in God. Salvation is of the Lord and it is immediate. Friends, if you need forgiveness immediately, he'll forgive you immediately as he did David. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Repent of your sin. We're going to pass out the communion elements. Repent of your sin. Ask Christ to forgive you. He will forgive you on the spot and you can know as we pass out the elements, you are forgiven. Call upon the name of the Lord. There's help for you in God.